Further, we'll be speaking about the matter of dukkha, which we didn't finish yesterday. And allow us to emphasize that the special issue or the most important point in Buddhism is the one about the about atta and anatta or self and not self. If if we if the five khandas, the five aggregates of life, are mixed up with upadana, with with grasping and clinging, then there will be there will be dukkha. But if if the upadana, the khandas are seen correctly as anatta, then there won't be this this dukkha. And so all all dukkha can be summarized as grasping and clinging at the five five aggregates of life. Now there are there are two things here that we should we should observe. First, if there's just the five khandas or we could say the mere khandas, just the khandas by themselves, without any attachment, any upadana involved, then there's nothing, there's nothing tormenting about that. There's no, there's no dukkha experienced regarding that. However, there is a, a quality or characteristic of dukkha within the five khandas. This is an important thing to understand. There is, because all the, because each of these five khandas is impermanent, unstable, and constantly changing, that has a quality of dukkha to it. However, this quality of dukkha does not torment. But if if anything goes in grasps or clings to these five khandas, then then because of that attachment, these five khandas will be a torment for that that one who grasps at them, whoever or whatever grasps at them or we could say their owner will suffer because of that grasping and clinging. But if it's just the five khandas, then there is no, no experience of torment or suffering. There is just the characteristic of dukkha that is inherent in all, all conditioned things. For example, with the the natural, the natural conditions of birth, age, illness, and death. These in themselves are not inherently suffering. When the mind, when nothing is attaching to birth, age, illness, and death as my birth, my age, my illness, my death, then they're not a problem. Then there is just this characteristic of dukkha in birth, age, illness, and death. But as soon as something grabs on as my birth, my age, my illness, my death, because of that upadana, then birth, age, illness, and death become a source of torment and suffering. So birth, age, illness, and death are not in themselves suffering, they, but they do have this characteristic of dukkha. And so if we are stupid enough to take them to be I or mine, then this, this becomes suffering for the owner of that birth, age, illness, and death. Or then those, 
naturally occurring conditions of of sorrow, lamentation, pain, misery, and grief. These these examples of these things are not are not necessarily suffering for for them for one. Only if these are not taken as mine, my sorrow, my grief, my my pain, my misery, or or they're not identified with I am the pain, I am the misery, I am the grief, and so on. If this doesn't happen, then they're just naturally occurring things, and they do not torment, they do not cause suffering, but they do have this quality of dukkha. But if one is foolish enough to, to if we take them as, as me or as mine, then these become a source of suffering. And the, the suffering arises not from the things themselves, but from this me, this me that gets involved, this me or mine that, that gets caught up that messes up these natural things or with the kinds of dukkha which arise from <coughs> from craving we meet up we experience things that we don't like we are separated from the things we we love we like and we desire things and then don't get them these are the kinds of dukkha that come from, from craving, from thirst. But notice, in all of these, there is the we. It's, it's me that has experiences what I don't like. It's me that is separated from the things that I love. It's me that has desires and doesn't get what I want. And so, it's because the attachment comes into all this that these are suffering for the mind. Because of that craving, attachment always gets involved. And so we attach to the experiencing, we attach to the separation, we attach to the not getting. And so this is always dukkha for us because of that craving there is there is always this attachment to it but if there was no there was no we to experience no no I to experience no I to be separated no I to not get what it wants then there wouldn't be any any torment any pain for the mind. For example, if we're, we're with someone who's our enemy, and then we think, my enemy, then there's a lot of, of dukkha involved. But if we, we meet someone who is our enemy, but we've forgotten that this person is our enemy, then there's no dukkha. There's no my enemy, there's no problem. Or with people we love. When we th are thinking of I love this or that or this person, then, then there will be dukkha. If from the separation from that person. But if we've forgotten that we, we love this person or thing, then there's no dukkha involved. Or <clears throat> not getting things that we desire. It's, this is only dukkha because of the I that desires. Because the I comes in, the my comes in, there is the, <clears throat> the ex experiencing of, of what we don't like and the separation from what we love. 
and the not getting what we desire. It's, it's because this I, this mind, comes in that these things, this, this experiencing what we don't like, this not getting what we, or this separation from the loved, the beloved, and the not getting what we want, these all occur because attachment, this sense of I and mine, the feeling that things are I or mine has arisen. Just if we, we meet my enemy that is suffering, or if we just hear the name of my enemy, then that is suffering. Or even to read their name in the newspaper, that is suffering in the form of anger or hatred or aversion or something like this makes makes the that owner the attacher suffer if there's no sense of this i or mind there's no there's no none of this occurs there's just the quality or characteristic of dukkha the thing itself that that person in themselves is not suffering but it's it's it becomes suffering the person becomes suffering for us because of the my the i or my gets involved and then because of this attachment there is the mind or the the owner experiences suffering but just just the thing in itself has only the characteristic of, of dukkha and nothing more so let's take another look at these five aggregates starting with rupa or the the body the bodily systems this this body is just a bunch of of processes or physical functions and in all this in the body there's constant change there's instability there's decay so there is a quality of of dukkha but that's just the body the body is dukkha in itself or or for itself but that's all that's happening if something does something to the body it's just something happening to the body but if attachment arises and it becomes my body then it's no longer something happening to the body it's something happening to me and this is where the suffering arises for example if a knife cuts a finger we don't we don't just see it as a knife cutting a finger we always experience that a knife cutting me the knife cut me the knife cut me not just something happening to the body but something happening to me because the attachment the i the ego gets in there it becomes suffering for the the owner of the me and mine the body has a nervous system which is used to to pick up or sense stimulation from the the outside world and it's just a nervous system that functions in certain ways it's just part of the body but we never see the nervous system as as just part of the body or just a nervous system it's not we don't see it that the nervous system picks up the stimuli or is sensitive to the stimuli it's always my nervous system I am 
aware of the stimuli. I am the one sensing things. It's not the nervous system sees, hears, and so on. It's always I, I, I. And so then the sense activity becomes suffering. The sensual experience, the activity of the nervous system is turned into suffering. If this sense of ego, this I in mind, is too strong, it can, it can lead to, it can be really, ri really ridiculous somewhat. It can be like, lead to a kind of hysteria. For example, one child was scratched by a thorn and no blood came out in the least. There was just a scratch with no blood and the child fainted. Another child was scratched by the thorn and thought nothing of it, just a scratch. But the first child, because of the sense of, of ego, this scratch, they, the child thought it was going to die. There really wasn't anything there, but it, because of the attachment was so strong, thought it was going to die and fainted. Or as the other child didn't think anything of being scratched. This is an example of how this, when this ego gets strong, too strong, it can lead to almost, it can lead to insanity. This is an example that's, that's happened to us. <clears throat> or when I was young, I was playing with a friend at the garbage pile, and uh, my friend picked up some paper that had some red ink on it. And then when, when he saw the, the red ink on his hand, he thought it was blood, and he went running home to his mother thinking he was going to die. I'm going to die, I'm going to die. The actual physical situation was just some red ink on the hand. But because of ego coming in, because of attachment, there was, it was turned into a lot of suffering. In the, in the Rupa Khanda, the body aggregate, there is constant change, constant transformation. And that's, that's just, what's happening for the body. That's just the body's thing. And there's no, there's no suffering involved in that change and decay and whatever. But when we give it the meaning, when we buy into the meaning that it is my, it is I or mine, then that change, that decay of the body is, is suffering, it's, it's torment for the one who attaches. The body in itself is just doing, doing its natural thing. But if ever this deeper meaning is given to things, then that deeper meaning of I, of mine, it doesn't matter whether it's I or mine, it, it's both of these the sense of I, the sense of mind, are upadana, and it inevitably is, is suffering. The body itself is not, is not suffering. <clears throat> or we can talk about vetana khanda, the feeling aggregates the feelings of, that are pleasant feelings, unpleasant feelings, and the, un, the hard to determine feelings. We never, this, we never see the feelings as just a mechanism of the nervous system, which has certain survival value. We can never see it this way. It always has to be, I feel. I feel pleased, I feel displeased, or my pleasure, my displeasure, my happiness, my, my pain. We aren't able to see it as merely a natural process of the nervous system. 
the Vedana are just things that, that happen of themselves. We're unable to do that. We're always taking it as I, as mine. And so we just ta we take something natural and ordinary and give it extra meaning. And this causes suffering. This attachment cause, turns the feelings into a problem. They, we make all kinds of difficulties out of them. The feelings in themselves, the Vedana in themselves, are no problem. It's, it's because of this attachment to them is I and mine, that there is suffering because of them. This I in mine is not real. It's, it's not true, it's an illusion. But it's something that we feel. And so because we feel this I in mind, it, it has the ability, it becomes suffering. But it's, it doesn't have any real reality. There's no real I in mind there. So with these, these feelings, they're something that we give meaning to. And because of that meaning, we take them to be I, take them to be mine. Sometimes our, our foolishness needs, leads to a direct identity with, with pleasure, with pain, or with that hard-to-determine kind of feeling. Other times, stupidity takes the form of I, taking these things to be mine, my pleasure, my pain, and so on. Because this, this I in mine is, is an illusion, it's not true. But because it's something we, because we feel it, but it's not true, then there is, there is suffering arising from it. Then the next two khandas, Sanya Khanda and Sankara Khanda, it works in basically the same way. There is perception, and then this is taken to be I, perce I perceive, or it can be attached to as my perception, and then this, this becomes suffering. These things are perceived in a certain way, and then that is attached to, that is taken to be true and real and clung to, and this clinging is attachment. Or there is conception, things are conceived in a certain way, there is thought conception, things are thought of in this way or that way. And then there is attachment is either I who conceives, the conceiver, the thinker, or my thoughts, my conceptions, my ideas. Either way, there's an illusion here, but we, we don't see the illusion, we think it's, it's actually true. And so the illusion of sanya and sankara occurs, and it's attached to as I as mine, attaching to the perceptions and the conceptions. And then this is the result of that illusion. And because of this attaching it is I and mine, there is, there is suffering. Sanya Khanda and Sankara Khanda are turned into suffering by attachment. Or with the fifth aggregate, Vijnana, consciousness. If, if we take, <clears throat> if we take vijnana to be some kind of self or a soul or a spirit, as in Hind the Hindu belief, then that will always be suffering. To take vijnana to be a self or soul, that will always lead to suffering. But if vijnana is is realized as just being the consciousness of sights, 
sounds, smells, tastes, touches, and mental objects. If it's vijnana is known as just this consciousness, this direct knowing of the sense objects, then there's no suffering. But if I comes in and turns it into I am conscious or my consciousness, then we've gone back to that soul or that spirit or self or whatever, and that, that brings suffering. And then all kinds of problems happen, and everything is made, life becomes a mess because of this I, this mind, or self, soul, ego, whatever we want to call it. As we said earlier, Thailand has received a lot of influence from India, especially in religious matters. And so that Hindu teachings or Brahmanistic teachings came to Thailand before the Buddhist teachings came. And so way back when, we don't know exactly when, the teachings came to Thailand about a certain kind of vijnana, which is what in English we call a spirit or a soul. In Now it's often called the Atman in Sanskrit, the Atman, which is a kind of spirit or, or soul. And what was taught was that there is this, this vijnana, vijnana, this spirit, and it has a center place. Sometimes it's said to be in the heart. And then the vijnana rests there. And then when an object comes to the eye, the vijnana runs out to the eye in order to see it. Or a sound comes in, the vijnana runs to the ear to hear the sound. The vijnana is always going out to these different things. But it's always the same vijnana. So it's, it's some kind of soul or spirit. And then when we go to sleep, this vijnana is said to leave the body and go wandering around. And then when we wake up, the vijnana comes back. If the vijnana comes back, we can't wake up. And if we're unconscious, then the vijnana goes off somewhere, but we don't know where. This is what has been taught in Thailand before Buddhism came. But in Buddhism, there's, there's none of this. It's just the, the momentary consciousness at the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, or mind sense. This is all that is meant by vijnana. But so many people have received this, this older teaching from India, that that's what is understood. And so words like vijnana are taken to mean spirit or, or soul, some eternal substance that is knowing all these things. This is what has happened in Thailand, this, this kind of belief in vijnana has occurred. And to put it bluntly, it's, it's completely a matter of, of ignorance. It's a complete misunderstanding to, to attribute consciousness to some soul or spirit, as has happened for many people here in this country. Exactly what the situation is in Europe, we don't know. You probably haven't received the same kind of influence from India. But maybe things aren't so different, because in European languages, we still find words like soul, spirit, and self. So it's possible that the same kind of misunderstanding is common in the West as well as here. If vijnana is conceived or understood or felt to be some kind of self 
or soul or spirit or lasting substance, then that, that is not the Buddhist teaching. That's a Hindu teaching or something else. But if vijnana is understood, is seen to be merely a momentary flash of consciousness in relation to some sense object, then that is the correct teaching in true, true Buddhism. If a vijnana is attached to in the first way as being I or mine, as being some kind of self, then that inevitably is suffering. Whereas if vijnana is understood correctly, seen correctly, then there's, there's no suffering. There's just that momentary consciousness arising and passing away. This is what Buddhism teaches. Please be very careful to understand this point correctly because many people are careless and confuse the two and then don't know what Buddhism is and don't know what other religions and other philosophies or what other religions and certain philosophies are saying. True Buddhism teaches, because of everything we've discussed so far, true Buddhism teaches to remove the sense of I in mind from the five khandhas. Please listen to this carefully. Write it down if you've got paper. What Buddhism is teaching, the genuine teaching of Buddhism, and if something contradicts this, then it's not Buddhism. Buddhism teaches to pull out that sense of I in mind, to pull it out of the five khandhas, remove the sense of I and mind from the five khandhas. So then there are just the five khandhas. There's just life occurring naturally without any upadana, without any I or mind making it heavy, making life into a problem. So removing I, the sense of I and mind from the khandhas, this is the heart of Buddhism. This is the, the central teaching of the Buddha. We'd like to take this opportunity to, to speak straightforward and, and direct and say something that ought to save you a lot of trouble, time, and even money. Most of you, if not all of you, have been deceived by a bunch of by a bunch of books which have been given such silly names as Buddhism in Thailand, Buddhism in Burma, Buddhism in Sri Lanka, Buddhism in Tibet, Buddhism in China, Buddhism in Japan, and even Buddhism in America. There are all these these books that are deceiving people, trying to talk about something that doesn't really even exist. This, any of these books that are talking about Buddhism in Thailand or Buddhism in Sri Lanka or Buddhism who knows where, they're just talking about some illusion. They're not really talking about Buddhism at all. If we buy this, if we buy these books and believe what they're telling us, then we'll never figure out what Buddhism is. Because all these books are just about a bunch of crazy cultural practices from whatever country it is. Just the crazy things the Thais do or the crazy things the Tibetans do or the crazy things now that they do in the West. And that has very little, if anything, to do with Buddhism. It's a bunch of ceremonies, it's a bunch of beliefs, it's a bunch of superstitions, it's all kinds of stuff. If, if, some, if you buy a book on Buddhism, there's no need to stick the words in Tibet or in Thailand or in Burma on the end of it. 
if it's a book about Buddhism, it will it will talk only about one thing: removing attachment from the five khandas. This is the nucleus of Buddhism. The rest of that stuff that they fill up these books with and rip off the unsuspecting public with is just a bunch of superficial cultural stuff. It's not Buddhism. It's just who knows what. And so you can save yourself the time and the trouble. There's no need buying any of these books and wasting our time with them. We've we've taken some time ourselves to the same goes with the the superficial distinctions between Theravada Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, Vajrayana Buddhism, and Zen Buddhism. To the superficialist or the Western scholar, they seem to be different things. But if it's Buddhism, it's all just one thing. There's only one Buddhism. Buddhism can't be fragmented into these different things. And so, if we can. We would like to to point this out to save everyone a lot of trouble. Real Buddhism is just one thing: removing attachment, getting rid of that I in mind within the five khandas, or regarding the five khandas. So, for those of you sitting here who are interested in going to study Tibetan Buddhism. Please, please take notice that there's no such thing as Theravada Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, Vajrayana Buddhism, and all that stuff. There's just one real Buddhism, and this is just pulling out that I in mind, pulling it out of the five khandas, so that there are just the khandas, removing this I in mind. Out from the khandas, this is this is Buddhism. Everything else is just been added to make things showy, to make it interesting, to make it impressive, to entertain the children, and all these things. But and so it makes the real teaching seem very profound, so that nobody can understand it. All this, all this extra stuff. Please, please find out what the real thing is, and save yourself the trouble of the other stuff. When we have studied, when we've personally studied some of the important Mahayana sutras, they all begin with a lot of crazy stuff suitable for that culture. But every important Mahayana sutra. Ends with the same thing: removing attachment from the five khandas. We've we've got a friend who's quite an intelligent person, and now they've really gotten into translating a bunch of very difficult to translate Tibetan texts. It seems that in Tibet they've got all kinds of things which which haven't been translated yet. Things which are very, very difficult to understand and hard to translate. And so, this friend of ours, and we won't mention the person's name, has completely gotten into this and is putting all their time and energy into translating these things. But no matter what they translate, they won't really find Buddhism itself. They'll just find a lot of complex, difficult understanding. To understand things which come from the ancient Tibetan culture, they're not finding Buddhism itself. They're finding a lot of things that have been dragged into Buddhism from the the old culture of that time and that that place. Real Buddhism is just this this one simple thing: removing. The sense of I and mine from the five khandas. This is something 
that this is something to study not from all those books, but from life. The scriptures that we ought to study are the scriptures, are the five khandas within our own life, within ourselves. To study these, the body, feelings, sensations, conceptions, and consciousness within our own life and see what they're like and see how this attachment arises and then see how to remove that attachment. This, this is the kind of scriptural study to do, to do it right here in this, this using our own life. So it's not necessary to go off to study Tibetan Buddhism or Sri Lankan Buddhism or Zen Buddhism or whatever. Just study it right here in your own life. The five khandas are right here. Why do we have to go off looking for Buddhism somewhere else? Now, we, we don't deny that there are differences. For example, Theravada Buddhism is, the most, is very straightforward and it has, it's kept within certain fairly strict limits. And people who don't have who don't have enough intelligence and wisdom are unable to understand the Theravada teachings properly. Then Mahayana has, has tried to open everything up and simplify things so that even foolish people, old, old grandmothers in the street, the ordinary man in the road, so that they can, op they can have access to, to Buddhism with the idea that this will, it's called Mahayana, the great vehicle, because it can take even the, the foolish people along. And then in Zen, Zen said, no, that's never going to work, and, and narrowed it really down, made a very exquisite, refined teaching for only the most intelligent people. If one isn't very sharp and clever, one can never figure out Zen Buddhism. And so it's the most direct, the most direct teaching, but it's also only for the most intelligent. And then in Vajrayana and all, the, and all those things, the Tantra and all that, they've kind of packaged the teachings in the most attractive, the most colorful, the most enticing and interesting way. So you've got these basic approaches to presenting Buddhism, the direct approach, the, the, the big approach, the, the quick and fast approach, the attractive approach. But even so, there are these distinctions. All of these come to the same point, to the same fact which is removing attachment from the five khandas. In a scientific era, in an era, in a time of, of, of high technology and reason, we don't have any real need anymore to be interested in all the different forms or superficial distinctions of Buddhism. In a scientific age like this, all we need is to take a very direct, natural and scientific approach to study the <coughs> five khandas right here and just and remove. All we need to ask is how to remove attachment from the five khandas. How to go about removing the sense of I and my from the five khandas. In, in, a, in times like this, this is all we need. So there's no, there's no need to go off anywhere. It's, it's all, everything we need to learn from and to work with. All the tools, all the equipment are, are right here. We should take a, a direct scientific approach Philosophy won't, won't help us. Just thinking 
in speculating with ideas and opinions isn't enough. We have to take a scientific approach that deals with the real things, not just theories about things, but deal with the real things directly, experiment in a practical way. This approach will teach us how to remove attachment from the five khandhas. So we've taken the time to discuss these various characteristics of variations within Buddhism because if we understand these points it will make us much easier, much more, much simpler for us to go about removing attachment from the five khandhas. So in summary, all dukkha occurs because of attachment in the five khandhas, attachment to one or the other or all of them together or whatever, any kind of attachment regarding the khandhas is, is dukkha. For example, if there's some pain in, say, the foot, it's only just a certain kind of physical situation which has a certain impact on the nervous system and that is felt as pain and that's all there is to it. It's just a certain physical phenomena. But, and if there's no attachment, if there's no attachment in there, it's not really dukkha. If this is something we often confuse, just ordinary pain from, from real dukkha, from real suffering, we often confuse the two. But if there's no attachment, then it's not really dukkha. It's just a physical phenomena. It's just something natural. But as soon as the feeling arises, I hurt. It's, it's my pain. I'm, my foot might fall off or I might die or whatever. Then a very tiny physical problem is blown up into a huge spiritual problem, a huge mental problem. So that people take simple physical difficulties and blow them up into fear, worry, neuroses. People even go crazy because of little physical ailments. Some people even die from the shock of having some, some minor physical mishap because of upadana. Suffering does not occur because of these natural situations. Suffering occurs because of upadana, the sense of I and mine regarding natural things. The Buddha did his best to help us understand this, this situation with upadana. And one of the ways he tried to explain it is using a, a simile. There are two kinds of arrows. There's just the ordinary kind of arrow. And then there is a second kind of arrow that has been soaked in poison. The tip of the arrow has been soaked in poison. And so then a person gets shot with the ordinary arrow. The ordinary arrow pierces this, this person's skin. And then all that is, there is pain, obviously. But that's all there is. There's just pain felt by the nervous system. But then the second arrow gets shot right in the same place. And the second arrow is coated with poison, has been soaked in all kinds of nasty poison. How much more is that going to hurt? How much worse is that going to make the wound? How much more damage 
is that second arrow going to do? The second arrow is upadana. The second arrow is that that feeling of I of mind. So this this helps us to to see the distinction between physical pain or the the characteristic of dukkha in things and the dukkha that is experienced directly by the mind because of upadana, because of I and mind. Please be very careful to remove this second arrow and don't don't let it shoot you again. But for the first for the most part we're getting shot by this second arrow pretty frequently. When when a knife cuts our finger, cuts the finger, then the finger has been shot by the first arrow. Then when we when we think or feel I have been cut by the knife or my finger has been cut by the knife then we've been shot by the second arrow this the arrow that has been soaked in the poison of attachment and the same kind of th- and then once that happens there is enormous suffering the mind is in torment and there's we've all of a sudden got a big problem if if and it's the same with everything if it's if there's just a natural mechanism taking place there's no problem but as soon as the second arrow of attachment of i and mind comes in then there's a big problem if we can understand this this point this one simple point then we will understand buddhism quite well our study of buddhism is is generally excessive we study many things that aren't really necessary we often stu- we even study things that are irrelevant or or trivial we're always asking questions about why do things have to be this way or when did this happen or why why do why do monks wear that color and things like this we ask a lot of questions that aren't really necessary the buddha to help us understand the danger of this mentioned another simile there was a man who was shot by an arrow and then his he was laying there in pain and his friends came to help him they were going to take out the arrow so that he would feel better but then he said wait don't take it out yet before you take it out i want to know who shot it and what cast is the man who shot it and what kind of arrow is it and what kind of who made the arrow and what kind of wood is it made from and what kind of poison is it coated with and he he had a long list of questions and he wouldn't let them take out the arrow until they answered all the questions is our approach to to buddhism the same as this where we ask a lot of unnecessary questions and so never get around to removing the arrow and so please be very careful about how you go about studying buddhism don't ask questions which aren't really necessary whenever you have the opportunity to 
to ask questions of a of a teacher. Please don't ask too many. If we ask too many questions, then there'll be so much information that the real information will get lost amongst all the irrelevant stuff. Just ask the necessary questions, the important questions. The, the, the most important question is how to remove attachment from the five khandhas. If we can keep things direct and simple like this, we'll save ourselves a lot of time and energy and confusion. Thus, we can summarize this all by saying that in Buddhism, the, the important thing is removing attachment from the five, from the five khandhas. All we need to do, all we need to study is these five khandhas right here, these living khandhas of our own life. Study them. Study them when there is just the khandhas, when there are pure khandhas without any attachment. And then study the upadana khandhas, the khandhas that are being clung to, as I and mine. If we, if we see more and more clearly the pure khandhas and the khandhas that are clung to, this is, this is all we really need to do. This is what vipassana is about. It's not necessary to go anywhere to do vipassana. Just Examine the khandhas, study the khandhas, scrutinize the khandhas very, very carefully to know what they are like, what the pure khandhas are like, the khandhas without attachment, and what the upadana khandhas are like, the khandhas that are being clung to as I and mine. This is all we really have to do in, in Buddhism. In Buddhism, we have a special name for the person who has been completely successful in their study and practice to the point they've finished, they've done everything that needs to be done. We call such a person an arahant, an arahant. To understand what arahant means in a very simple way, we don't have to give any complicated definition. An arahant is just the pure khandhas. What we call the arahant is the name we give to body-mind that is just these five pure khandhas without any attachment. In the arahant there is no attachment whatsoever, not even the least bit. But in us ordinary worldlings, us, us thick ones, ordinary thicksters, there is, there is always attachment, there is constantly arising attachment. In some of us quite a bit, in others not as much. And this is the difference between the arahant and the worldling, the thick one whether there is any attachment left or not. The word arahant has turned out to be very difficult to translate into English and other, in other European languages. And most of, the, most of the translations we've seen are not very good. So to keep things correct and simple, we ought to define or understand arahant as a, a life of, of, of pure khandhas without any attachment. 
where there are just pure khandas without any attachment. That is the, the arahant. This is a simple and clear definition. When there isn't any attachment, there is no suffering. The arahant is completely beyond, completely free of, of dukkha. And so what this means is to have completely removed all attachment from the five khandas. That's how it's traditionally said. We talk about extinguishing attachment in the five khandas or removing all attachment from the five khandas. But if we were more if we spoke a little more correctly or a, a little more precisely, we could say that the thing to do is to prevent the arising of attachment in the five khandas. To always be removing attachment is a real hassle, but to, to stop it before it happens is much, much more exquisite. What they say, an, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And so the real thing is to live, is to understand Dhamma. Know the Dhamma, understand Dhamma. And then by being careful, by being mindful and careful, never slipping or making mistakes, preventing the arising of attachment in the five khandas. So don't just get rid of attachment, stop it from, from happening. When we use the word being careful or not being careless, the Pali word is apamata. This is a very important word. When we say be careful, don't be careless, what we mean is it's like the house, our house is on fire and we've got to hurry and get all our possessions out as quickly as we can. This is what we mean by being, by being careful. If we, if we wait and have to ask, well, who started the fire and what kind, where did they buy the, the gasoline from what company and who made the matches, and, and what way is the wind blowing and all these things, then the house will burn down. So the thing is just to hurry and get everything out of the house before it burns down. So be very careful and get rid of, eliminate and prevent all attachment regarding the five khandas. As, as quickly as we're able to do so. So we're worried that you'll spend too much time on studying unnecessary things and that your, your things will go too slow and you'll never, never achieve what should be achieved. And so we, we encourage you just to give your attention to the central issue, finding out what attachment is, how it arises, and learning how to get rid of that attachment regarding the five khandas, learning how to remove it all. And so we encourage you to give all your attention to this and not, not spend time asking unnecessary questions questions that aren't really relevant or practical. Just do what needs to be done to remove all attachment from the five khandas. The system of practice that is called anapanasati, mindfulness with breathing, is a very, is an excellent way to remove attachment from the five khandas. You've come here with an interest in learning about anapanasati and learning how to practice it. 
So we encourage you in this and hope that you can maintain the focus in using anapanasati to remove attachment from the five khandhas. This is the only thing that we need to be interested in. We've been talking about the noble truth of dukkha, dukkha ariya satcha. And we should understand it's important to, to get clear that there are many ways of talking about dukkha. This is a, one of the difficulties of language. When we use the word dukkha, we can mean to the dukkha, the pain, the misery itself, that which torments the mind, that dukkha itself. When we say some, when we use dukkha, it can be the thing itself, or we can mean dukkha as that which brings dukkha, that which leads to suffering. And this is somewhat different. And then another meaning of dukkha, another way of using the word, is having the characteristic of dukkha, having the lakana of dukkha. There are these three ways of understanding dukkha. Dukkha that is directly experienced. Dukkha that is torment within the mind. The things that lead to that dukkha. And then the characteristic of dukkha in all conditioned things. Because dukkha can be understood because of the the inherent difficulty of language, the inherent ambiguity, the way we have to twist words around to try and explain things. We're left with these three different ways of using the word dukkha. When we talk about the noble truth of dukkha, under, we, it's important to understand that the dukkha that is meant here is the first kind that dukkha that torments the mind. This is our problem. The others are not really a problem. The problem is this dukkha that is tormenting us and preventing us from being at peace. It's this dukkha that we directly experience as pain and misery in the mind that arises from upadana. If we understand how to remove attachment from the five khandhas, then we will understand this noble truth of dukkha sufficiently. When you have understood dukkha thoroughly, then you will see for yourselves that it is the most ugly thing there is. It is the most frightening thing. It's the most disgusting and terrible thing there is. We'll see this for ourselves when, when, we, see, when we see dukkha. If we don't see this fact, if we haven't really seen dukkha, then we'll fall in love with it. When we don't understand dukkha, when we haven't seen it as it is, we, we fall in love with it. We keep attaching to things. We fall in love with attachment because attachment has an incredibly power, a tr powerful attraction. This I in mind is tr terribly deceptive and it has a very profound influence. And so it's very easy to fall in love with, with ego, with with upadana, with, a, with attachment. And so, instead of getting free of dukkha, we fall in love with it. And then we keep plunging ourselves into dukkha over and over again. So why do we have to dress up in beautiful clothes? Why do we have these beauty pageants? Why must we eat delicious food? Why must we do all these, all these things? 
The reason is that we have we have mistaken dukkha for happiness and we've fallen in love with dukkha. We've fallen in love with with attachment. And so for this reason we we turn life into a lot of dukkha, a series of of difficulties and problems. So in short, please please know dukkha in the three ways that we mentioned at the very start yesterday. See dukkha as being painful, in, as being tormenting suffering. Second, see dukkha as being ugly, as being ugly and disgusting, the most <laughs> ugly, disgusting thing there is. And third, see, see dukkha as the most empty, meaningless, worthless thing there is. If one sees dukkha in these three ways, then one will have understood the noble truth of dukkha thoroughly. We could speak on and on and on about dukkha. There are all kinds of little details we could mention, but what we have discussed so far is enough. What is attachment and how to remove attachment? This, if we understand this, then we understand the noble truth of dukkha, dukkha ariya satcha. So this is enough. This is enough talking about this first noble truth. And so we'll finish our talk on the on the dukkha ni dukkha ariya sat. And that's it also for for today. The meeting is closed for this morning.